Greetings from Seville Man. In my previous video, I promised to do something about the poorly performing RAN sticks that came with my new Legion laptop. Here's what the issue was. Lenovo apparently used inferior single rank by 16 memory modules instead of going for superior single rank by 8. Without going into too much detail, by 8 memory modules are internally organized in 4 band groups, whereas by 16 modules only contain 2. Since the memory controller in the CPU can usually perform access, read or especially write operations faster across different band groups, then within a single band group, by 8 memory modules perform way better. When it comes to RAM, it's indeed confusing for end users to differentiate between single and dual channel, single and dual rank, and by 8 and by 16's configurations. And it's even very annoying that OEMs don't even like to disclose this type of information in the first place. They usually share just the memory capacity or also perhaps data transfer rates. But as I will soon show you, the other attributes do matter. Being a geek or a freak, I wanted to upgrade to the fastest memory possible, so I almost shot myself in the foot with Crucial Ballistics Kit which had a superb cast latency of 16 ticks. Not that the kit was bad or anything, it's just that Lenovo does not support XMP or memory overclocking on their AMD-based laptops. Oh dear! Since Ryzen 5000 series CPUs officially only support speed up to DDR4-3200 with JEDEC standard timings, I ended up buying a single rank by 8 Kingston HyperX Impact Kit with a cast latency of 20. It's still a reasonably fast 16GB memory kit, just with a bit looser timings than the aforementioned crucial goodness. Disassembling process of this laptop was a bit painful. Though I appreciated the use of 10 standard Phillips head screws, it was merely impossible to pry the bottom panel without damaging it. It's not a big deal, but it's certainly frustrating. If it was meant to act as a tamper-proof seal, it certainly served its purpose. I used this opportunity to also upgrade the factory installed half terabyte Hynix SSD with another drive. Of course, I took a wrong guess where the unoccupied M.2 slot was located at first. Anyways, it's neat, they placed a thermal pad on the bottom of the metal shroud which can now serve as a heatsink. I purchased a 1TB version of XPG SX8200 Pro, which is a reasonably fast DRAM-less PCIe Gen 3 drive. This one, fortunately, doesn't run as hot as, for example, Samsung 980, which I showed in one of my previous videos. Here comes the shiny RAM kit! Can't wait to see the results! Let me now demonstrate the difference in performance stock versus upgrade by running synthetic benchmarks first. Then we'll have a look at some games too. Ada memory benchmark clearly shows the major disadvantage of the stock by 16 memory sticks. Though they offer slightly lower overall latency than the by 8 modules, their write as well as copy speed is rather lousy. Read and copy speed went up by modest 7 to 8% 
but the ride speed increased by over 22%. Limpack is also a good example of a demanding workload in terms of memory throughput. The RAM upgrade boosted the overall score by over 16%. Let us also have a quick peek at 3 d Mark Time Spy. It's clear the RAM upgrade mainly benefits CPU-bound scenarios, while the GPU overclock, on the other hand, boosts GPU-bound applications. If you therefore like to play competitive first-person shooters, faster memory is the way to go. Speaking of FPS games, though I could see improvements in gaming performance across the board, I was a little disappointed with Battlefield 5. I originally assumed the poor 1% lows were caused purely by the inferior band group configuration. Although the mediocre memory stick certainly had negative impact on the game, the suspicious 1% lows did not go away completely with the upgrade. I also tested the single-player campaign, The Last Tiger Mission. It certainly performed better, but as you can see, the 1% lows ended up being inconsistent even here. There's simply no way GPU overclocking would tank 1% lows by 10 FPS. And 1080p results were even worse, so I'm convinced it's the game engine to blame. Battlefield 5 is apparently extremely demanding when it comes to CPU power, which is hardly surprising as, for example, the Conquest mode lets you play with 63 other players and all their whereabouts need to be calculated 60 times per second. That makes me think, hmm, if a modern 6-core 12-thread mobile CPU struggles to run Battlefield 5 smoothly, what about the new Battlefield 2042? which offers game modes with 128 players. Lenovo Legion 5 Pro has a solid cooling solution, therefore I gave it a try with GPU overclocking. I was pleasantly surprised the GPU clock could be boosted by another 200 MHz in most games. Ok, Cyberpunk was a bit too sensitive, so I had to lower the overclock by 20 MHz, but still, that's not bad at all. The video RAM could be overclocked by 500 megabits per second too. Of course, the performance thermal mode together with the overclock made the fans spin fast. It's not a big deal for me, as I like to play with headphones, but I confess the fans were a bit loud. I recommend using at least a passive laptop cooling stand to supply some more fresh air. In my last video, we had a look at Control, Cyberpunk, as well as Watch Dogs Legion. Let me now show you how well they run after the RAM upgrade, as well as GPU overclocking. I'll focus on 1440p results, which is a more reasonable resolution for this laptop screen. Of course, 1080p with low settings could yield even better figures, but we are not here to achieve legendary scores today. Or are we? Cyberpunk is GPU bound and with DLSS enabled at 1440p, overclocking only delivers diminishing returns. In Watch Dogs Legion, I achieved a 15% performance bump in average FPS and a massive 41% increase in 1% lows after the RAM upgrade. This is what I honestly expected of Battlefield 5, but you know how it went. GPU overclocking, however, only provided me with extra 2 to 3 frames per second, which is again nothing to get excited about. I have added Shadow of the Tomb Raider as well as Horizon Zero Dawn to the list. However, I didn't get to benchmark the stock configuration, so let me just show the average FPS across a few graphic settings with the new RAM modules installed. DLSS offers a noticeable performance boost both in 1080p as well as 1440p in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, while GPU overclocking does boost performance in 1440p, it's just runtime variance in 1080p. Ray tracing, as expected, 
tanks performance big time. Please note, Shadow of the Tomb Raider only uses ray trace shadows. Can anyone even tell the difference? 1080p is playable, but 1440p is a no-go for me. Horizon Zero Dawn surprisingly provides a very similar 90-ish FPS experience almost throughout the whole selected configuration range. Despite the pain with the bottom panel, I think the upgrade was worth the effort overall. There is a noticeable performance improvement both in games as well as compute workloads. And I killed two birds with one stone as I was also able to increase laptop storage capacity. It's still a shame Lenovo used the inferior single rank by 16 memory modules, but I'm guessing the supply shortages might have played a role in this too. That's another reason why I always prefer as much upgradability as possible. That's all I have for you today. Thank you for watching and have a nice one.